Okay, let's start uh, in the back. I guess there's some seats here in the middle. Um, in the next half an hour, I'm going to talk a bit about postmortems and what we can learn from them. Uh, before I start, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Puya. I'm a developer advocate at Giant Swarm and a product owner. I see myself kind of in this triangle between the community that is around here and online, customers or potential customers and end users, and our product. And what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to start a bit about the context where we did this made these learnings. I'm going to talk a bit about the postmortem process and some war stories that I promised. And then I'm going to go into the part where we talk about hardening and how we can avoid, or at least um, how we can cope with these kind of um, issues in our clusters. So let's start with the setting. We run around 100 and something clusters as Giant Swarm. And these run on different clouds. They run in different regions all around the world. They run on-premise, some of them. And I list China separately here, because it's kind of a different beast. Uh, could give a full talk just on China. But hit me up afterwards if you want to hear war stories from there. Um, and then there is a lot of diversity in these clusters because they run for different companies. They're, these companies come from different industries, from like, um, I don't know, from insurance to banking to uh, retail. And uh, inside these companies, there's different kinds of users. There's like the end user developer that writes code. There is an admin. There is architects. There's all kinds of end users that using these clusters or using or at least are somehow in touch with the Kubernetes. And then there is different use cases. We have like IoT use cases. There is uh, machine learning use cases. There's just the, the very big e-commerce use cases. So um, handling this, we go and we opt for, for more freedom. So you could go and say, we lock everything down and we don't allow anything. But that's not how we work. It's, um, I kind of believe in trusting your users. And I think us as operators of Kubernetes and infrastructures, we should rather opt for freedom and give developers the freedom that they wanted to have with all these new technologies that we built in the last five, six years. So what you need to do once you give users a lot of freedom is you need to educate them a lot. So you need to talk a lot. You need to write a lot of documentation. And on the other side, you can't avoid misuse. You, you can't avoid misconfiguration. So you need to kind of harden up. And that's where postmortems come in. Failures happen. And they happen a lot. Uh, this postmortem philosophy, I'm not sure if it's the original kind of uh, source, but Google puts it pretty well. Um, the goal is to document incidents, to find all the root causes that contribute to this incident, and then basically be able to fix it, or at least avoid that it spreads too far. And how does it work at Giant Swarm? It's basically we gather issues, we fix them in code, and we roll it out to production. And what helps us there is uh, we use issue templates in GitHub. We're not on Jira or something. We just use GitHub plain. And this issue template helps us gather all the information. It reminds us, hey, please add all the logs. Add screenshots if you have them. Add upstream issues if you have already found them. Maybe you already have a suggestion how to solve this because you, you already looked a bit into this because you had to fix it in production, at least. And then uh, we give these issues very, very high pro uh, priority. They're higher prioritized than our product issues. And they're assigned to a cross-functional team, so they can be solved within that single team. And it looks a bit like a load balancer. The postmortem comes in, it gets to a team, and the product owner of the team uh, assigns it or talks to their t uh, team and assigns it to someone. And one of our SREs was mentioning this guy in the end, or this girl, um, they should be actually unhappy to get this postmortem because like, sometimes it's really frustrating, right? You're like rabbit holing on this issue, you can't find a root cause, you can't find a fix. It's really hard. But sometimes it's also really interesting because you find you have stories for afterwards, you have stories to share, like I'm going to share here, and you feel kind of like a detective. Right? That's, that's, that's the fun part of it. 
And uh, we see a lot of issues. Um, this is roughly a year, because in November last year, we added this label in our GitHub postmortem. So roughly a year of postmortems for us means more than 500 of them. I mean, some of them are really small. It might be like some UX small quirk or like logs filling up a disk and it's fixable really fast. Some of them might be a bit harder. And I'm gonna share some of them here. Uh, if you wanna hear more, um, just hit me up afterwards and I'm maybe gonna blog about this and add more to this. Um, but let's see into some of them and what we can learn from them. And um, I'm not sure if some of you ran into this issue. Um, 111 uh, Kubernetes had a memory leak and was only fixed in 111.4. Um, and we had it in production since 111.1 for some customers. So until the fix landed upstream and could be released, we had to actually patch our own Hypercube image and roll it out to, to production for some customers. So that is something that you need to be comfortable with. As operators and SREs for Kubernetes and for cloud native technologies, sometimes, and especially if you're running in production, you need to be ready to get into the code, ready to fix upstream even if you want to, or in, and if you need to. So this is something that you should be prepared for. And then, um, I mean, if you run ingress controllers, you've maybe seen um, there, there can be issues, especially if you run complex software like uh, Nginx. We usually run Nginx, we're very happy with it. Uh, but in certain versions, in older versions, for example, a faulty ingress, like having a wrong certificate in your ingress, would break the whole ingress controller. And that means like, even if your monitoring front end has a wrong uh, certificate, it could break your production website because it's running on the same ingress controller usually, right? And then remember what I said in the beginning, we have lots of teams working on these clusters and we give them lots of freedom, you get lots of issues, right? So you need to find a way how to harden against this. And in, in this case, it was basically update to a newer version that is better like, or less prone towards misconfiguration. And this is like 0.15, 0.17 upwards of Nginx uh, does that. Uh, sometimes you might need to have some other like, measures where you monitor and audit the ingress objects that people are putting into the cluster. Um, this one is funny. Um, we love the Calico people and they fixed this issue actually, but there was a, for a very short time, there was this issue where IP, IP tunnels were just closing after a while. So we built this very small hacky tool which was basically pinging the full mesh of IP, IP tunnels all the time <laughs> for them to be kept alive, right? And this is something that SREs are basically, that's, that's the day-to-day -day sometimes. You just build some hacky solution and then you find to work with, you try to work with upstream to fix the, the actual issue. But sometimes for now you need to fix it because it might be already in production. Or even if it's only in dev, dev is important, right? Your developers will be blocked if you cannot fix the issue, so you need to fix it somehow. And I don't know if, 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 if you guys run no tests, low tests. Uh, low tests are funny, especially if you're uh, not the person doing them. And if you knew, and this was like two years ago where like Kubernetes at this customer was at least quite new and it was like, ah, oh, that's new software like Calico and QProxy and Angus controllers. And the load test went wrong. There was like 300,000 requests a second, should have been 100,000, and it broke the whole cluster. Like, it, it, like traffic went down, went away, and everything like that. Must be your Calico, must be your new software there. Turns out it was EC2. Um, they had very few machines. There was very few machines that were running ingress controllers. And um, there were small machines too. So network would like cut off at seven gigabit. So the solution was basically just scale it up. But sometimes, um, and in this case, the metrics were somehow lying. Because if you run Calico and pods and containers, you would run it in host network. And if you look at the metrics for this container, you see the host metrics of the network, right? So you think, okay, this, if you see the metrics are cutting off there, so you think, ah, oh, it must be this container. But it was not. So this is just like a very small glimpse into it. If I had time, I would like share a lot more with you. But let's get to the gist of it and try to find like, how, what can we do against it? And how can we like, in general, 
try to, to be better and, and like better prepared for these issues. And I tried to then go into the data, and I'm not super data driven, but I, I went just into our postmortems, had a look, and looked what are the hot spots. And one of the hot spots is, and we, we actually have that even down in the, in the contract that you need to upgrade, but old versions are usually more prone to issues. And then the other issue is ingress controllers or ingress by itself, because I mean, that's where traffic comes in, that's where uptime is kind of happening. So there's a lot of issues around that. The networking DNS, I mean, most people know there's some issues around networking somehow happening all the time. And then uh, one thing that is, I guess, pretty common around Kubernetes, especially if you have newer users and uh, users who are like, uh, not very deep into the matter yet, is resource pressure. And I'm gonna talk about like, each of these in, in detail in a bit. And one, the last one is multi-tenancy, basically. And there's certain issues that are just happening if you have a lot of ten tenants, a lot of teams. And um, so let's get into the meat. Uh, old versions. Basically, um, by definitions, if you see like change logs of new components, and it's not only Kubernetes, right? It's also all your critical components, the, the DNS that you're running, maybe you're running Istio, all these things. Um, usually, change logs have a lot of issues fixed, right? So, running a newer issue is is often recommended, and especially if you have a good security department, they will force you to run certain <laughs> versions. And then just look at CVEs and where they are fixed. Like uh, in Nginx Ingress, for example, there was two, two CVEs. They were fixed in 0.21. If you were stuck on a very old version and were just lazy because everything works and you didn't want to upgrade because why upgrade a working system, right? But now you need to upgrade to 0.21 just to fix the CVE. So you have a lot of room, like a lot of things to catch up on. There's maybe uh, configuration changes, there might be a flag change, there might be changes in the annotations that you need to do. This is a lot of work. And if you need to roll it out through a day, like if your security department or someone says, hey, we need to fix it now, and we're in production, it's like Black Friday, we need to do this, then you have a lot of work and you need to force every t all the teams to do all-nighters and work all weekend to just get to the new version. That said, you need to test upgrades extensively. Um, even if there is no breaking change, everything should be fine. There might be some configuration that you are doing that you have that might not be tested. Right? There is like, we all in the engineering field, like we know software cannot be 100% tested. At least, I mean, NASA might be doing it, or in some <laughs> cases, but you, you need to test for yourself and you should have at least some test clusters, some dev clusters, you should be able to spin something up and, and test it around before you do the upgrade in the actual production environments. And then try to automate your processes, automate the upgrades, or at least have some process where you say, um, just maybe subscribe in Slack to the, to the GitHub release feed, and then have a team responsible for each component. Have someone who thinks, okay, this is my job to keep this up to date, to keep at least very close to, to the latest. I mean, you don't need to run zero one, uh, dot zero all the time. And uh, if you've been to the Contributor Summit yesterday, Brian was also talking about this, like maybe don't run the dot zero in production always. Um, but you need to, to, to stay on top of this. And the more like, depth, upgrade depth you, you, you gather, the harder it will get. The other thing is ingress, and um, we do like the Nginx ingress, and our customers like it a lot, because it's very configurable, there's lots of options, it's, everyone knows Nginx, and it has a lot of power, but it's kind of like with great, uh, great power comes great responsibility, you can break things, right? And if you don't want to take away all the features from your, from your users, you need to, on the one side, run your versions, and sometimes you need to think about, maybe you want to separate controllers. Like in the case where the Prometheus cert was taking down production, you could have run an, an Ingress controller just for your workloads, for your production, your user-facing workloads, and then one for admin. Right? This way you cannot influence each other that much. 
And then you should do, and this is not only for ingress, this is just in general, you should do load and failover testing. And with failover testing, I mean, try what happens if I take half the ingress controllers down? What happens if I take a full node down? And try to see also, like, what happens when I upgrade in production, like, upgrade my parts? Do I have, like, lost connections in between them? This way you find if you're really graceful also in your software, if your settings for the ingress controller or for some load balancers are graceful enough to really have zero, zero downtime when you have a lot of traffic. Like try to load test like, or fail over test under traffic. That's really important. And then last resort, if you're, at least if you're on the cloud, um, that should be pretty easy. Use service of type load balancer. Especially we've seen if you use a lot of web, WebSocket connections, like we had a test with like five million WebSocket connections at the same time. If you have that, then try, like most ingress controllers won't work for you. Just use a load balancer directly for that service. Might be a bit more expensive, but um, it's worth it, right? On the other side, networking in DNS, there is no like golden rule there. The main thing is do monitor and alert on those things you might see issues before they actually happen. And this is like really important to see, to have like preventive monitoring and alerting on things. If you see something lagging, if you see latencies, then maybe go in and, and, and try to find out what it is before a failure happens. And then check on known issues. There is a lot of issues. Maybe uh, currently there's this core DNS five second issue with Alpine, uh, mainly with Alpine, with UDP. Um, there is a lot of workarounds out there already. And even if you're not seeing it yet, you might want to already apply the best practices and apply some of these workarounds because maybe you will only get into this issue at scale. And maybe you don't have that kind of traffic yet, but maybe you have it next week. And then it fails and then it was too late. So try to apply these best practices early. <clears throat> And then um, resource pressure, and there's like full talks about this. Uh, Michael from VMware has a very good talk about this last time in Copenhagen. I'm gonna link to this in the end. Um, it's not only about requests and, and uh, limits and all these QoS, it's also about seeing that your containers are behaving. And that's especially the case if you're an enterprise, you're gonna see a lot of Java containers and some Java containers don't behave, right? Uh, there's blog posts about that. Red Hat has a re very good blog post about that. So read those and, and be careful. But also include buffers. Like we recommend usually at least one or two nodes as a buffer, because you never know when a node goes, goes down. Or maybe you, you're gonna do an upgrade and you're a bit more aggressive in your upgrade. Have some buffers so that a node going down doesn't create so much pressure in the rest of your cluster to take the whole thing down. And then there is this, this case, if you create pressure, what goes down first? If your kubelet goes down under pressure or your proxy, then you have a really big issue, right? Because then you have a full node going away and then that just like propagates through your cluster and you take the whole cluster down. So you need to protect these and you also need to protect your critical add-ons, your, your DNS, your networking, if those get killed before your workloads, you haven't protected your workloads. You, it's really important. And then last but not least, in the multi-tenancy use case, it's not only about like isolating on namespaces and RBAC. And I've seen these things where it's like, we have RBAC and PSP turned on, but everyone is a cluster admin. <laughs> Wasn't really useful, right? <laughs> but it happens, and they're like, our security department is okay with that. Um, I wouldn't do that. And especially, even if you trust all your users, and you should, don't do it just because you might run into issues. Just like everyone is tired once or runs the wrong command. If you've not given the, the rights to run certain commands, then less things can happen. And if you can, try to even separate clusters. If you, if you really can, if you have workloads that don't depend on each other and you have the chance to run more clusters, you will decrease your blast radius just by running more clusters next to each other. And then, especially in production, 
try to automate as much as possible. No manual ops. Try to have a pipeline into it, and everyone uses the pipeline, at least in production. And then you need maybe a few SRE accounts to get in in the worst case. But then you don't need to do that many, like all the RBAC users uh, and, and configuration and production anymore. And you have a lot less issues. And you will have reviews when you do GitOps. You can really review every change that you do. And you don't go in and change something manually. Uh, I think Kelsey tweeted out yes, no, last week about kubectl being the new SSH. And I'm pretty much on that, in prod at least. Because um, if you cube CTL into your prod cluster, you're doing something wrong usually. Last but not least, um, some best practices here um, do have a good monitoring and alerting setup. Uh, Promises and Alert Manager are great. Have something like PagerDuty or OpsGenie that wakes people up. If there is something wrong, if you don't fix it during the night, even if, if important for you may, might, not, might only be office hours, if you leave it overnight, in the morning you're going to have a bigger issue. And that might be worse to, to handle than just fixing it during the night in five minutes. Because it's going to take an hour maybe then. Or it's going to be even worse. And then when, while you're debugging, and you need to debug a lot maybe, um, have a good logging setup, have maybe even tracing if you can. And sometimes you see these issues, they occur, and um, they, they lead to downtime. But maybe you, you were having these issues even the last months. But you just didn't see them because they didn't, like, there was some, something in the environment that didn't make them really influence your, your production workloads, for example. They maybe were just influencing some other things, and you didn't see them. But at least if you have some historical data and you're monitoring and logging, you will find patterns better and find issues uh, that you might not have seen before. And as I said, fix issues fast. Um, if you can, I mean, some issues you just take a while and you need to go upstream and you need to ask people and find, find solutions. But um, in general, try to be as fast as possible and give, give these issues just priority. And then, um, for me personally, very important, you need to educate users and really talk to everyone and see that people understand what they're doing. Because especially in, if you have a lot of teams, we had this issue where um, there was 20 teams or 10 teams on a cluster, and there was an ingress controller. And one team decided to have a second ingress controller in that cluster. But they didn't tell all the other teams, so there was no ingress classes on the ingress objects. It doesn't work. Um, there should have been communication, but sometimes there's not. And you need to foster that communication, too. And if you see things, then try to talk to the users and see if they know about it. Because sometimes even like, management or operations personnel um, might not know about some things that are happening in there, because they didn't like, look every, every hour and every minute into your cluster. And then um, have a process for postmortems. That's super important. If you don't have a process, you're not going to stick to it. Uh, you need to write something down. You don't need to use our process or something that is in the Google SRE book. You need to find your own process with your own tooling. But have a process and, and try to, to stick to it. And then most importantly, uh, and this is something that is, that is something uh, a lot of people have backups and, and uh, use, I don't know, Haptio Arc maybe and, and all these things to, to recover. And, but they don't train the recovery. And you should train. You should see how fast can I get back. Because we are, we are like in microservices world nowadays. We are in cloud native world. You need to, you, you will have failures. And maybe you will get even a failure that takes a whole cluster down, and there might not be even any state left anymore. It might be a full wiped etcd, and you need to get up. And maybe even think about this set, like the scenario where what happens if everything goes away, and someone just gives me a new Kubernetes API? How fast can I just get back if I just have an API? I just get an API from someone. Someone gives it to me for free, for testing maybe. And how fast can I get back into production just with that? Am I really that, like, that backed up? 
do I really have all state, everything that needs to be there in production somewhere that is not in my cluster? And that's super important. And stand on the shoulder of, of giants. Like there's a lot of people out there, um, I mean, from Datadog to OpenAI to BitMEX that are sharing what they're finding at scale sometimes in their clusters. There's a lot of people on this conference and on other conferences sharing their experiences in blog posts and talks. Try to read them, try to find them as operations personnel. And even if you don't see these issues right now, try to see if there's something that I can do already. And also, especially with the resource management, read about this. There is, uh, and Michael put, put up uh, a really nice list. This is a gist, the, the second from below. There's a, a, a gist with lots of links around resource management and best practices that you can apply to your clusters. And try to go through these and find things and, and learn about these things because you don't need to do the same learnings that all of us did running these things at the edge and, and, and really at scale. Even if you're, if you're just starting out, you can already learn about this and don't do the same mistakes and don't run into the same issues that we did. And in the end, if you, if you do run into issues, there's always people that, that can help you. There's Kubernetes Slack, and uh, there's also Kubernetes office hours, where once a month, a lot of people from this community, a lot of maintainers and developers from the Kubernetes community, sit there and just answer your questions. No matter what issues you have, We'll just come and answer. We can't SSH into your clusters. But come and ask the questions, and we'll maybe point you to the right people, point you to the right direction, where you should look, what kind of logs, and maybe we'll help you afterwards even, even more in Stack Overflow or somewhere. Now, that's pretty important to, to, for me to, to be able to have this community and stand on the shoulder of this community to use it as a resource for yourself. This is like something, if you take one thing out of this, out of this talk, is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You, you can stand on the shoulder of giants here. And before I open up towards questions, uh, I want to thank everyone who gave me feedback to this uh, talk, and especially uh, our team at Giant Swarm. It's a crazy bunch. Uh, we're not a lot of people. And uh, if, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be here. I couldn't share the war stories. Because most of the time, I'm not the one who's, who wakes up at 3 AM. It's one of these people. And um, I'd like to thank them for this. And if you don't get to, question, uh, to, to put your question right now towards me, just hit me up on, online or after this, and we'll talk. Thank you. <laughs>